Mm-hmm. All right, now, very, very, very famous um, chapter here, Psalm 12. And these, what I'm going to be focusing on there, of course, is probably the most famous, the mo- or most widely preached on, at least these days. Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a fir- furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now, um, of course, we are a, a King James only uh, Baptist church. That's, that's what we are. That's what we believe. We believe God has preserved his word and we have it today in the English language and that 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 those words are found in English in the King James Version. And I know I haven't, I haven't really preached on this much. I meant to preach on it earlier, but since we got the, the DVD here, the New World or Bible versions, I didn't feel like there was that much of a need. But um, it's really important. It's really foundational doctrinally. Um, and it's also important to be able to, and I know I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone here has already settled on this, but um, to be able to show other people, like we were just out soul winning yesterday, and um, you know, and the issue kind of came up. It didn't come up for very long, but it's important to be able to know this stuff and know it well enough to be able to show others why we believe what we believe. You know, it's one thing to have seen it, and I remember when I first converted to 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 being King James only and saying, you know what? No, this is the truth. This is the word of God. You know, you, you hear the arguments and you see them and it's enough to convince you, which is great. But you're not always then able to show somebody else, you know, what you just learned. Because you could say, oh, well, I, I learned it, but I can't really explain to you why. You know, I can't show you that. I don't remember the verses. So, you know, if you, if you like to take notes during preaching, this is a good time to take notes. We can look at these things. And what I'm first going to do is just prove that God has preserved his word for us today. So we're going to go we're going to look at some scriptures pretty quickly to prove that and then we're going to be going in to a lot more detail on one particular version of the Bible that's out there now which is the New King James version of the Bible. And the reason why I want to pick on this one specifically, see, if the NIV is like the most popular one right now, and that's where a lot of preaching is, de- is dedicated to and devoted to because it's so popular, because so many people use it. But I want to focus on the New King James Version because this one is prob- it's the most subtle and it's the most similar to the King James Version. It's, mo- it's the most like it. So that's what makes it so deceptive. That's what makes it so, so tricky is that it, 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 you know, it's made so closely to the, to the real thing that it's extremely subtle. And, and the difference is, you know, you might overlook them. And I want to point them out this morning so we can see what those differences are. But first, we, it's really important to get founded that God has preserved his words for us today. And we have them. They exist today. And we saw here in Psalm 12, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now, if you think about the purification process for silver, for metals, right? They heat it up in a furnace. They heat it up real hot. And what that does... Is, is all the, the other elements will burn off the stuff that's not the pure silver. You know, um, the metals that we have today typically, you know, it's not all just, it, it's usually not all just made comprised of one metal. Um, it usually it, it's, um, you know, you have a few metals bound together and for things like our steel chairs or other things, it's not that big of a deal. Um, to have some other metals mixed in there. It doesn't have to be pure because of the, the, per, the function that it's performing, right? But you have something like silver, something that's valuable, something you're going to use as like money, there's something that holds a value. Um, the amount of content in that, uh, of silver content in that uh, matters. And what they would do is they would try it in a furnace. It would try and it would be like testing it and they're, they're, they're heating it up so that all the impurities will go away. Anything, any small pieces, in that, that process of heating it up, that will get all of the impurities out of that silver. And as we said, if it's God's word, our pure words, it says um, purified like seven times. So if you take that, you know, you do it one time, you heat it up, you get rid of the impurities, let it cool down, put it back in again, you're going to get more out. And then and seven times, there is repeat the process so that there is no way there's anything left in that. You know, you've done this seven times of removing the impurities. And that's what it's relating God's word to saying, look, God's words are pure words. There is no... You know, the Bible says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 
Well, God is truth, and in him there's no lies at all, and God's words are pure. They're true. They're light. He has no doubt. There is, there is no twisting of God's word. Now, man has gone, and the devil has gone, and tried to twist God's word, and he has done that, but God's words, his words, are pure. And that's why it says in verse 7, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So when this psalm was written, in Psalm 12, he says, from this generation forever. So going all the way forward, these words that, that God was revealing unto, unto David and unto the rest of the, the people that were used of God to, to, preserve, to, to, um, to give his word, they are preserved. And the reason why they're preserved, it's not because man preserves them. God preserves them. And I believe that. And this is important to believe that because, look, if it was completely and solely just left up to men to preserve God's word, then yes, I would agree that, okay, there's mistakes in the Bible. Yeah, there's prob it's prob we probably can't trust it 100% if I'm only going to rely on man. If that is all I have left to, to rely on is just on man's ability to do this, then I would have a lot more reason to think that there's, there's a reason to doubt this. But when the Bible says that God is going to keep them and God is going to preserve them, hey, God's perfect. If God's able to give us his word, if God's able to miraculously use men to ever, even the first time, right? You have these people that will say, oh, the Bible is only, only pure in the original autographs, which we don't have today. They say, oh, only in the original time it was penned down. That was God's word. But now we don't have that today. You think that God is going gonna, is gonna to perform this miracle of allowing men to, to, to speak his word and to write his word and go through that trouble to give us his word, but then just for it to be lost because, oh, well, yeah, we, we, can't, we can't keep it. No, God's going to preserve it. And it's, the Bible tells us right here God's going to preserve it. It's a promise that he made. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, you don't have to turn there. Turn if you would to Psalm 33. Um, since you're in Psalms 12, turn to Psalm 33. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So even then, I mean, in the New Testament... The apostles were saying, look, we thank God that when you heard the word of God, because they were preaching the word of God unto them. He says, you received it not as the word of men, not as if it's our words that we're speaking to you, but God's words. And, and that's what they were claiming. They were preaching God's word and they had it back then. And, it, you know, in the New Testament, if they're quoting the Old Testament, hey, that's a long time that passed from the book of Psalms being, being you know, given out to the time that the apostles were walking around this earth. And they, they claimed they had God's word. They had it available to them back then. It was God's word, not their own words, not the word of men. And that's what a lot of people would say too. A lot of critics will say, oh, the Bible, that's just written by men. That's just, those are just some men that wrote that book. No, it's not. These are not the words of men. These are the words of God, which is why we, we use the Bible as our authority for anything. If it was just some man's opinion, who cares? Why would, we, why would we come and congregate together three times a week and study and memorize and learn and preach from this book if this book was only just man's opinion? I would, I'll tell you what, I would not devote that much time to just some man's opinion. I would not spend and dedicate my life to, to reading and studying and serving God based on a book if I thought the book was just written by men. It's not. It's God's word. The Bible says, are you in Psalm 33? Look at verse 11. The Bible says, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. The counsel, right? It's what God's telling you. is his advice. What he's giving you. It stands forever. And the thoughts of his heart to all generations. All generations have the ability to receive God's word. All generation. It doesn't get lost. It wasn't buried under a rock for a thousand years or two thousand years, as as a lot of people like to think that these new versions now that they're using these manuscripts that were buried somewhere, thrown in a trash can, never used by anybody for thousands of years. Now all of a sudden they think that that's how God preserved it. No, it's been available for all generations. Um, look at Psalm 100. Turn to Psalm 100 if you would. 
There's a lot of places in the book of Psalms that will, will explain that, that God's word is being preserved, that God has promised to preserve his word for us forever. Psalm 100, verse number 5, the Bible says, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Again, his truth endureth to all generations. Look at Psalm 111. You're in Psalm 100, look at Psalm 111. And then we're going to be going to Psalm 119 after that. Psalm 111. Psalm 111, verse 7 says, The works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. Again, his commandments are sure. Right? His commandments we receive from the Bible, from his word, what he's told us to do. It says, they stand fast forever and ever. Psalm 119, look at verse 160. Psalm 119 is the, the, the longest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 119, right you know, close to the end there, uh, verse 160, the Bible says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. We see here a lot of, a lot of references to being forever. Right? From this generation, forever. Forever. God's word is, is, is retained forever. And he's revealed it unto us, and he's promised to preserve his word forever. And I'll read this for you from Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of, the word of our God shall stand forever. These are promises. This, this, is, this is doctrine from the Bible. This is God's word promising and telling us that his word shall stand forever. So, or Isaiah 59, 21 says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words, which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Again, a very similar statement that was made in Psalm 12 where we, where we started, um, you know, from this generation, from henceforth, from this moment and forever, this, the, the, my words shall not depart out of your mouth, your children's, your grandchildren, and so on and so forth. For all generations to come, my word is not going to depart out of your mouth. And he's given them this, his word from that moment, from henceforth, the moment that he gave them to Isaiah. Right? The moment God gave him his words, he says, they're, they're going to last forever. Matthew 24, 35, again, another famous verse says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. All of this scripture given, and this isn't even all of it. Okay, all this scripture given just to, just to prove that, look, God has promised to preserve his word. God's word endures for all generations. So then, of course, the next logical question would be is, well, where is God's word? Where does it exist? And I'm not going to prove the King James Bible this morning. Um, I don't think I need to do that. But just knowing the, the, the sense that God has preserved his word, it's got to be somewhere. Okay, it's got to be somewhere. And English has been used. If you just look at the fruits of what has happened with, with the English language in general, and where has Christianity flourished more than anywhere else in modern history, and just let's look at the past few hundred years, right? It's not, it's not happening in China. It's not happening in Saudi Arabia. It's not happening in all these other places over the world. But in English-speaking countries, in America, and even in, in, in other places that are English-speaking, look, God's word has really, has really gone far and wide. And, I mean, this country was founded on, on Christian principles and Christian beliefs and Bible-believing people in general. Look, I, I mean, you bring up all these examples. Look, these people didn't believe, whatever. But by and large, our, our whole justice system and, and the foundation of our government was very heavily intermixed with Christian principles. And, um, and it was religious persecution that brought so many people here to begin with because they were Christian. Not because they were some other religion. It was, it was a Christian persecution that drove a lot of people here to begin with. And with the amount of fruits coming from, from English-speaking people, it makes sense that God's word was preserved in English. Right? I mean, if, if that much good work and that much good fruit is coming from, you know, from people, as a people in general, 
The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You need the Word of God to get people saved. You need the Word of God to be saved. I mean, that is vital part. This is, is just as vital as Jesus Christ is. Jesus is the Word. We need the Word to be saved. We need Jesus Christ to be saved. We need God's Word. Now, if people are getting saved and if God's work is being done, hey, whoever is doing that work has to have God's Word. Right? It only makes sense. I mean, in order to have that type of result, in order to have that type of fruit, in order for people to be getting saved, they got to be getting saved from God's Word. And with the amount of people and the amount of work being done for God, hey, God's Word exists in the English language. It's not that hard to see. It's not that hard to understand or that, that hard to prove. And um, we know if we know it exists, okay, well, where is it? Well, this Bible has been around for over 400 years. None of the other modern versions have. None of them. And, um, you know, again, I don't want to get into all the details of this book because there's, it's so amazing when you look at the translation and the history and everything else that goes into it. And again, we have the DVDs up here if you haven't seen the New World Oral Bible versions that does a great job of giving a lot of the history of the King James and kind of the, where it came from um, and, and, and how magnificent it is. But... Um, what I want to spend time doing today, though, is exposing this. It's a perversion of the Bible in the New King James Version because it's actually it's very popular today. It's a version that's that is that is widespread, and what the, it's it's really widespread on on lies. Just like all the versions, you know, they claim to be easier to read, easier to understand. One of the things they do, and I'm not even going to get into this that much, but one of the things they do is they remove. The these and the thous and yees. Okay? Because they say, well, we're trying to put it into modern language. We want people to understand it better because no one's going around saying thee and thou in today's language. So they say, we're just making it easier to, to read in today's society. But the, the big problem that you have when you do that, you remove meaning. You make it a little bit more ambiguous. Now, does that automatically make it wrong? In today's language, no, but you're lo now, now you're going to be losing some of the meaning because the thee and thou are a singular. It means you're talking to one person, an individual. Versus the ye and the you, you're talking to more than one person. You're talking to many people. Now, that comes into play when you're trying to understand a verse. If all it ever says is you, 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 well, now you don't know and you can't always even tell from the context if you're talking to one person or if you're talking to multiple people, right? Um, one example of this is Jesus Christ said, um, Satan hath desired to have you, but I have prayed for thee when he was talking to, to Peter. He made it very personal because, look, he says, Satan has desired to have you. Satan desired to have all of you. And he's talking to Peter. He says, but I have prayed for thee. Look, I prayed for you personally. I, I prayed for you specifically. That's just one example. I mean, it's, it's that one lack, low loss of meaning that you get. But I'm going to go into even more um, corruptions of his word. And um, Brother Sebastian, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to give you... I've got a copy of the New King James right here. I've got some other ones as well. And you can... Um, <laughs> you've got one too? Well, well check this out. And here... What we're going to do, we're going to do some comparisons. Okay? We're going to do some comparisons. I want everyone, because this is important, right? We're going to be looking, we're going to be looking back and forth. And um, if you wouldn't mind turning to, um, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. This is where we're going to start. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And everyone who doesn't have that, you could, you could look up 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. And I'll read it out of, the, out of the King James. The King James Version says, in 2 Corinthians 2, 17, it says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Very important verse. It says, look, we are not like many people that corrupt the Word of God. So even back then, right, even in the day of the apostles, there were people that were out that were corrupting the Word of God. This has been happening throughout all of history. This goes, excuse me, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When Satan said to Eve, Yea, hath God said... 
ye shall surely die in the day that you... He, 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 Satan's attack on God's word started all the way back in the Garden of Eden and has been going on ever since then. Satan wants nothing more than people to doubt the authenticity of God's word and what God actually said. He wants there to be confusion. Which is why there's so many hundreds of versions of the Bible out there today that all say different things. And that's, it's a common um, problem that I hear with people when I go out and talk to them to say, well, how do you even know which Bible is right? Because there's so many. Hey, Satan's doing a great job right there because he's getting people confused and thinking, well, what did God even really say? We have all of these different versions. What did he say? The corruption has been going on ever since these days. And that's why he says in 2 Corinthians 2.17, We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. We're giving you God's word. He said we're giving you the truth from God. We're giving you his pure word. We're not corrupting God's word. Important to understand that. But look at what the, if you would, read for us 2 Corinthians 2.17 out of the New King James. What does it say? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Now, maybe you didn't notice that because, look, almost all of the words match up almost identically. Almost. The key, almost. But the key difference, and that's what makes it subtle. What's the key thing that changed? They changed corrupting the Word of God to peddling the Word of God. Now, let me ask you this. Is corruption and corrupting the Word of God the same as peddling? No, two different words. Peddling is selling, right? When you peddle something, you're selling. But when you corrupt something, you're changing it. You're not just selling it, you're changing it, right? You're corrupting it. You're making it. It's going from pure to impure. Now, God's word, God said either one or the other. God did not say both. They do not have the same meaning, right? And you can do this with any other version that you want. You look up and see when, when two books and when two verses, when two chapters, whatever, say two different things. These two different things are obviously not the same. They do not have the same meaning. You cannot even tell me they have the same meaning. Look, those are two different words. Those are going to be two different Greek words. Right? Going back to, say, the originals. Right? If you're going backwards, say, okay, well, this is translated from something. They're not going to be translated from the same word. Corruption and selling are com two completely different words. So what's the truth? Right? That's, a, that's the first thing you should see is, okay, well, they can't both be true because they're saying two different things. And we're going to see that through all of these. And I'm going to expose to you, it's going to come up a little bit later. If there is a book, let me ask you this, if there is a book that contradicts itself, it says one thing in this place, and then another thing over here. If you have a blatant contradiction, not just a misunderstanding, but I mean, it's spelled out and right on the surface, you can see what this is saying, you can see what that's saying, and they just completely contradict each other. That is not the Word of God. God's Word is not going to have contradictions strewn throughout it. And I'm going to show you in the New King James where that, that book does contradict itself. Now, we're not there yet, but this is an important notice of difference. That Look, of course, people who are corrupting God's word don't even want to have this verse in there about corrupting God's word. They're going to change it to peddling and say, oh, no, we don't, we don't sell it, which they do that, too. I mean, if you want to look at the copyright and stuff, the whole purpose of these new versions in general, it's, it's, it's for one, the attack on God's word and get people confused by Satan. But it's also people who have the love of money. And while we're on the love of money, let's go ahead and turn to... 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. You, uh, yeah, turn there in, in that book for me, please, Brother Sebastian. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Because the love of money is why people even put out these books. It's one of the reasons, right? I mean, there's the, the, the ultimate goal for Satan is to just get people confused and to get people to, to, to not be able to trust God's word and to, and to believe a lie instead of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse number 10. The King James Bible reads, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now what does it say, Brother Sebastian, in, in the New King James? 
For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some... Have right. And notice it says there, a root of all kinds of evil, instead of the root of yeah. all evil. Big difference there. Now, now, if something has a root, right, there's one root. It's not, it's not a root, like, well, there's multiple roots to this problem. It doesn't even make sense. I mean, plants have a root. You know, like, like <laughs> you don't have multiple roots and multiple sources. It's, there's one source. The Bible says that love of money is the root of all evil. Not all kinds of evil, but all evil. And see, these problems exist because, you know, the, the translators don't understand it. Because they're not saved. Okay, they're corrupting God's word. They're not saved. They don't understand it. So when they come across something that they don't understand... They're going to change it to say, well, it can't be the root of all evil because that doesn't make any sense to me. How could the love of money be the root of all evil? So any evil that happens in the world, the root is the love of money. Because they don't understand it, they have to change God's word to, to be something that, that they more understand. Well, it's a root of all kinds of evil. Not all evil, but just all kinds of evil, all different kinds. No, it's the root of all evil. They're saying two different things. But let's go back. We're going to start. I'm going to, I'm going to try to bounce through some of these pretty quick. You don't have to turn to all these because I've got them all listed out here anyways. But we're going to go to Genesis. And you can follow along with as many as you want. Genesis 24. No, no. I'm going to, I'm going to read some of these because I, I don't want to take up too much time this morning. I've got a lot of verses to go through. I'll, I'll tell you the next time I'm going to have you turn in that book. But... Um, Genesis 24, 47, and this one's kind of funny, but still, it's a, it's a difference, okay? Genesis 24, 47, it says, And I asked her and said, Whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bare unto him. And I put the earring upon her face and the bracelets upon her hands. Of course, this is when um, Abraham's servant went out to find a wife for Isaac, right? And... Um, <coughs> He finds Rebecca, he puts a, the earring upon her face, but look at what it says in the, in the New King James. It says, Then I asked her and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the nose ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. The King James says, I put the earring upon her face. And the New King James says, I put the nose ring on her nose. Now, again, you might say, Oh, well, what's the big deal? Well, they're two different things. Putting an earring on someone, that's your ear. Right? And putting a nose ring on someone, that's your nose. And um, again, two different things. It's kind of, it's, it's just, that one's a little bit more silly of an example, I guess. But still, I mean, you can't just mess with God's word, even if you think it's silly. Right? I mean, even, even if you say, oh, well, what's the big deal there? That's not affecting doctrine. No, but is, it, is that what God said or not? Is that God's word? Did he put a, a, a nose ring on her nose or an earring on her ear? I mean, which one is it? What did he, what did he really do? Another thing they did in, uh, is remove references to sodomites in the Old Testament. The word sodomite. Um, not their actions. You know, of course, the Sodom and Gomorrah story is still there. But, but the, the reference to just the word sodomite. And this is the attack. See, it's a subtle attack. They'll start removing different words. And, and try to get them out of vocabulary to get, to get people to not even understand. That's why today, because the word sodomite has been removed from so many Bibles, when I preach, because I like using biblical terms and biblical references and saying, look, when I talk about the sodomites, you know, a lot of people don't even understand what that is. They don't even know, well, what are you talking about? What's a sodomite? And that's why I often have to just explain, look, it's the queers, it's the fags, it's the people, you know, let's use today's terminology so you understand it. But it's the sodomites, and it's important to understand, though, because here's what they've done, too. In 1 Kings 14, 24, I'll just give you one example, because in the book of Kings and Chronicles, it mentions the sodomites, and it mentions the kings who got the sodomites out of the land. Those references are, are exchanged for different words. Here's one verse in 1 Kings 14, 24, it says, And there were also sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. The New King James says, And there were also perverted persons in the land. They did according to all the abominations of nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Now, are, are Sodomites perverted? Of course they are. But do you notice how that lessens the impact, though, of just saying, well, this is a perverted person. 
versus saying that's a sodomite. Sodomite has a lot more weight, and it's a lot more negative to be called a sodomite than it is just to be called a perverted person. Now, look, I wouldn't want to be called either, of course, but like if you're describing someone and just saying someone's a little bit perverted, that can be way different than saying that person's a sodomite. Okay, two different things. And by removing that, they're changing it. They're changing God's word. Psalm 109, verse 6, and I, I can't believe this one. Psalm 109, verse 6 says, in the King James Bible, Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. Now, we've seen in a few places in the Bible, the Bible talks about, you know, delivering such an one unto Satan that the flesh may be destroyed so that, uh, so that their soul might be saved, right? The Bible talks about people that you need to deliver unto Satan, specifically. And that lines up perfectly with Psalm 109, 6, where it says, Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. Basically, delivering people unto Satan because they need to be chastised, they need to be disciplined, right? So that their soul can be saved, so that, so that they, could, they could, you know, in the end, um, <clears throat> turn out right. Um, the New King James, that verse says, Set a wicked man over him, and let an accuser stand at his right hand. Just an accuser. Now, we know that, you know, the word Satan's name is, means he's an accuser. That's what his name means. He is, he's an accuser of the brethren. That's what he does. But just, just giving a generic an accuser stand at his right hand, as opposed to let Satan stand at his right hand, again, it's, 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 it's watering it down. Right? It's watering down the message. It's, it's saying, instead of saying let Satan stand at his right hand, let an, an accuser. And what's interesting about this is that there's a footnote. There's a footnote in the New King James that a little, you know, it's a little A or a little B or whatever is just showing you as a footnote that says, well, in the Hebrew, it says Satan. So they're saying like they know in the Hebrew text, in the text of God's word that they're using to supposedly translate from, it says Satan. But they're going to say, well, no, we're going to put in an accuser because we know better than God. We have his words, but we're still going to change it and put an accuser in there instead of Satan. The audacity of these people to think that they know better and that they're going to put in something else, even though the own manuscripts that they're supposedly looking at says something different, well, we're just going to change it because we know better. That is deceptive. That is, that is subtle and that is of the devil. Many places, and see, you know, a lot of these people will say, oh, well, but that's not really affecting court doctrine. So it's not that big of a deal. You know, you're nitpicking at these. No, I'm not nitpicking. Jesus Christ said that, you know, by every word of God shall man live. You know, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live. Every word of God is important. Every word of God is pure. Look, you can't go around changing any of these. But here's some important doctrine that does get changed. Turn, if you would, please, in the New King James to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Let me ask a question this morning. Who thinks it's difficult to get saved? Who thinks it's really hard to get saved? Does anyone think it's difficult? Or who thinks it's easy? All we got to do is put our faith in Christ. Right? That's it. It's easy. Jesus did all the hard work when he was crucified and you know he lived a sinless life he lived a perfect life he didn't reproach people he did everything he was supposed to do he did the hard work he died on the cross he went to hell for three days and three nights he rose again from the dead he did all the hard work he's given us a gift and says all you got to do is believe that's easy let's look at see and, and again this is um in matthew 7 13 the bible says jesus was saying you know enter ye in at the straight gate for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, of course, that verse makes perfect sense. He's saying, look, the way to hell is wide. There's lots of ways to go to hell. Right? You could, I mean, you could believe in Islam. You could believe in Buddha. You could be an atheist. You could be, you know, whatever. All these different things. Hey, the way to hell is wide. But the way to heaven is narrow, right? It's straight as a gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life because 
Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. It's very narrow. It's very selected. Look, it's only this one way is the only way you can get to heaven. Read for us, Brother Sebastian, verses 13 and 14 from the New King James. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Notice it said, difficult is the way which leads to life. So first it's saying narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. Is getting saved difficult? No. Not at all. That is, that is just a lie. That is an outright lie, just, just showing people that, look, hey, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way. It's, it's hard to get saved. No, it's not hard to get saved. Jesus Christ died for all of our sins. And, and how do you change a word? You know, they use, in the King James, the, the, you know, the translation, and supposedly, supposedly, too, the new King James supposedly is supposed to be using the Texas Receptus, and that they're just modernizing the language. Right? That's their claim. That's what they're, they're claiming to do. And in a few places, they use some, some other of the, 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 the new archaeological finds. Changing this verse from straight is the gate and narrow is the way, how do you change either straight or narrow, which both are synonyms. They mean the same thing. Straight means narrow, right? To be difficult. Not even close to the same word, not even in the same ballpark, not the same, you know, Latin root word or Greek word, root word at all. I mean, they're just completely different. Difficult and narrow are, are two completely different things. You cannot get this rendering from the same word. It's not just an alternate. Look, salvation is not difficult. Let's go to our next verse, our next reference. John 5, 24. My personal favorite verse in the entire Bible. Of course, they ruined that one too. My favorite verse in the entire Bible, John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that, that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. I use that verse out soul winning almost every single time I talk to somebody because it makes it so clear that it says, whosoever believeth on him, you have everlasting life from that moment forward and you shall not come into condemnation. I would say, what is condemnation? That's hell. That's the second death. Look, you shall not go to hell. This is why we have eternal security. I know I'm never going to hell. I'm never going to have condemnation because I passed from death into life because I believed on Christ. New King James says, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but it's passed from death and life. You might say, well, what's the difference? I mean, isn't, isn't condemnation a judgment? Yeah, condemnation is a judgment, but not all judgment is condemnation. Big difference there. Think about this. Every Christian will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. That is where we will stand. Now, does that mean that we're going to be thrown into the lake of fire? No. No. That's not what's going to happen. That's where he's going to mete out our rewards and give us the rewards based on our works, based on the good things that we've done in our life. Hey, at the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to value what we've done for him and then give us our rewards based on that. But it's still a judgment. It's a judgment of our works. We have not, it doesn't, so saying that we shall not come into judgment is not true. That's a lie. That's false. But saying that we shall not come into condemnation, that is true. We will not be condemned. We are not condemned. We will never go into condemnation from the Lord because of our sins, but we will come into judgment. Two different things. And it might, again, subtle differences, right? On the surface, without really thinking too much about it, you'd be like, oh, well, what's the big deal? And again, one word, right? The rest of these words, you know, I don't have that much of a problem with. It's basically the same thing, okay? But when you, when you look at that, that one word makes, makes a world of difference. It changes the meaning. It changes doctrine. It changes everything. Acts 17, 22. The Bible says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. He's talking to these Greeks. He's talking to them saying, Look, you're too superstitious, which they are. They're superstitious. About all these, they have all these different gods for all these different things. They're superstitious. The New King James changes that, Acts 17, 22, to say, Then Paul stood in the midst of, of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. 
Now, again, I'll tell you, this is on the agenda. What's the most common phrase you hear? Well, I, I know I hear today from liberal Christianity is, I don't have a religion, I have a relationship. That is, is just thrown out there. Oh, I don't, I don't believe in religion, I have a relationship. I don't have a religion, I have a relationship. All over the place. Look, religion is not a curse word. Religion is not bad in the Bible. Now, if you have a false religion, yes, that is bad. Having a false religion and, and, and following a false god and, and doing things or having a different type of an attitude about yourself where you're lifting yourself up over others, yeah, those are wrong and those are sin. But if you're going to use the right word, hey, the Bible says that pure religion and undefiled is this, to visit the fatherless and widows. And I forgot the rest of the verse. But, <laughs> but in James chapter 1, it tells you that you know, there is a pure religion and undefiled. And it's to go out to do the works, to visit the Father, and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's the rest of it. To, to obey God's commandments. That's pure religion. And people look at that and say, oh, I don't like religion. You have all these rules. Well, to keep yourself unspotted from the world, the Bible says that's pure religion. So you're going to say, well, I don't like religion. It's pure religion. So they, they, they'll take verses like this and say, oh, you guys are very religious. and Because that's, that's derogatory the way he's saying that here, obviously. I mean, he's talking to these people and say, hey, look, you guys are you're just too religious. That's not what he said. He said, you're too superstitious. They had false doctrine, false beliefs. It's not that they were religious. It's that they were superstitious. Two different things. Acts 24, 14 says, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Again, he's saying, look, they call me a heretic. They say that, that, that what I am, the way I believe is heresy according to their religion. Right? That's what he's saying. In the New King James, it says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so worship I the God of my fathers. Now, a sect, that's like a, like a section. It would be kind of like a denomination, right? I mean, you have a sect of the Pharisees, a sect of the Sadducees, right? Well, <laughs> they weren't going after Paul and trying to kill him because he was just a part of a sect, right? That he was just, oh, well, you believe this, but you're still a Pharisee, or you believe this and you're, you know, you're a Sadducee. They were trying to kill him because they thought he was a heretic, Big difference in heresy versus just being a, a you know a section of, of you know a sect of, of that religion, right? Two different things. First Corinthians 1 21 says, for <laughs> and, and these I, I tried to pick out some of the worst examples. There's a lot. There's a lot throughout the books, but you can look at them and be like, you know, and I was looking at them saying, okay, well, just in case people are gonna be like, oh, well, that's not really that big of a deal. To me, all of them are a big deal because every word of God is important and it's true. But I tried to, I, you know, and, and I'll, you know, I'm telling you right now, honestly, I tried to find the, the, the most egregious places because if you could at least see this, then the rest of it, it, you could just toss it anyways, just based on what we're seeing here. 1 Corinthians 1.21 says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So the Bible is referring to, to preaching, preaching the gospel, you know, a guy standing up and preaching God's word. You know, people look at that as the foolishness of preaching, right? The New King James says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached. Is the message that's being preached foolishness? No. The message is not foolishness at all. That is blasphemy to even say that the, the message that's being preached is foolishness. Now, you can say preaching is foolishness, right? I mean, the world will look at you and say, Oh, there's that preacher, he's yelling, he's hooping and hollering, or whatever. Right? The preaching is a foolishness. God's using that preaching. Say, I'm going to use that, you know, the preaching of foolishness, um, or by the foolishness of preaching, excuse me, no, I'm going to get it right, to save them that believe. That's the, the, the means, that's the method that God uses for people to get saved. Say, look, I want you to preach. I want you to preach the gospel to every creature. That's how people are going to get saved. And, you know, people might call that foolishness, but that's the way that God chose. The message is, cannot be referred to as foolishness. It's two different things. The, the, the foolishness of the message preached. No, the message is nothing to do with foolishness. 
1 Corinthians 6, 9, I'm going to try to hurry up and get through these. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Big list of sins there, but the, the point that we need to point out here is effeminate. The Bible is saying, look, it's a sin for a man to be effeminate. Effeminate means acting like a girl, acting like a woman, right? Men are supposed to act like men, and women act like women. And for a man to be effeminate is a sin. God looks at that. It's disgusting to God for a man to act like a woman. But the New King James says, it says, um, I'm going to kind of skip around here, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterer, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. It changes effeminate to homosexuals. Someone who's effeminate is not necessarily homosexual. Right? There are people who are not, there are not sodomites, that are not homosexuals, but they're a little girly. Okay, that's a sin. They need to change that, but it doesn't mean that they've just gone reprobate and gone, you know, after strange flesh. I've known people that, that have acted a little, you know, a little bit feminine, maybe a little, you know, the way they speak or their mannerisms. Hey, look, act like a man. But that doesn't mean that they were, they were queer, right? I mean, there's, there's a big difference. And what's interesting here is that they said, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. It's like, why are you repeating yourself? You're using basically the same thing. Homosexuals, sodomites, yeah, it's, that's the same thing. Why are you listing both of them off in the same verse? Whereas the, the King James says, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind. Again, neither one says sodomite or homosexual. But um, even though I do believe that the abusers of themselves of mankind has to do with that. But um, regardless of that, one more change, you know, removing that, that effeminate of being a sin out of the Bible. Ephesians 5.1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Good commandment, right? We're supposed to follow God. We're going to be a follower of God. He sets forth the example. But the, in the New King James, it says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. Now are we, and again, subtlety, right? You're imitating someone as being like them or being like the Most High. So like, who's the one that said that I will be like the Most High? And that was sin. That was Satan. Satan's the one that says, I'm going to be like the Most High. Right? He wants to be God or like God. We are not supposed to be like God um, in, in, in every sense. right? I mean, God is God. We don't want to, to take his place and, and imitate everything about him. God is the one who's the king. We're not going to imitate the king and, and you know, do everything that, that he would do. Now, we're followers of him. That is, is absolutely right. And Christ has given us an example to follow, right? But we're not going to do all of the things that God does. We're not, we can't completely imitate God. But we, need, we do need to be a follower of Him. Again, subtle differences. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Right? Good admonition. Hey, not only should we not do evil, we should not even appear to be evil. I mean, try to keep yourself from even looking like you're doing anything wrong. You may not have, you know, drink a beer or anything like that. Well, you shouldn't even be going into a bar and sitting down at the bar and, and you know, or, you know what I mean? Like, like that's, hey, look, that's the, even though you're not, you may not be doing anything wrong specifically, right? Like, you're not, you're not drinking, you're not partaking. Hey, Stay away from the appearance of evil, right? You don't want people looking at you and be like, oh man, yeah, I saw, I saw Baz of Burns walking into that bar. You know, that's the appearance of evil. That's the appearance, even, even if I did nothing wrong, right? I didn't do anything, I didn't do any evil. The Bible's admonishing us, hey, abstain from all appearance of evil. Don't even look like you're doing anything wrong. New King James says, abstain from every form of evil. Every form of evil. Not the appearance of evil, but just abstain from every form of evil. Again, Two different things. So I'm gonna wrap I'm gonna wrap this up because we're running out of time. Turn if you would please to, to um, Titus chapter three. I already went over the root of all evil. Now 
in, in three places at least, the New King James says, um, and I'll read these real quickly. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. The New King James says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Again, it changes are saved to being saved. Hey, salvation is not a process. Salvation is done the moment you put your faith in Christ. You are saved. It's a done deal. Your soul is saved. You're not being saved. You're not in the process of being saved. You are saved. 2 Corinthians 2.15 basically says the exact same thing. Changes them that are saved to them that are being saved. And in Hebrews 10.14, same exact thing. It changes them that are sanctified to those who are being sanctified. All differences, all different things. Changing a past tense to like a, a, a current, a present tense. I'm going to close with this. In, he, in Titus 3.10, the Bible says, A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Right? So he says, look, you come in contact with a heretic, someone who's, just, who's, who's speaking heresy and lies, you give them one admonition, Right? You give them a second chance, say, look, no, God's word says this. And then you reject them. If they're going to continue to be a heretic and they're not going to listen to sound doctrine and God's word, reject them. And that's a heretic. A heretic is someone who's just speaking heresy, right? Speaking things that are, that, that are just way off, just completely wrong. Not a, not a small, not a more of a minor disagreement about God's word. I mean, a heretic is obviously a lot stronger than that. someone who's, who's, who's going against God's word completely. Um, what does it say, Brother Sebastian, in Titus 3.10, in the New King James? Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. Re yeah, reject a divisive man. Now, a heretic and a divisive man are two different things. A divisive man. I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of who a divisive man was. Maybe you remember this verse. Luke 12.51 Jesus Christ himself was saying this, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. Jesus Christ said, I came to bring division. The New King James in Titus 3.10 says, Reject a divisive man. Jesus Christ was divisive. He divided people. Hey, look, you either are going to believe on God or you're not. That divides people. You cannot bring everybody together. Jesus is probably the most divisive man in the world. You do not reject a divisive man. You rejected heretic. Christ was not a heretic. He spoke the truth, but his, his word divides. It's divisive. People are going to say, look, I believe this, or you don't. It's very divisive. For the New King James to say reject a divisive man, it's saying to reject Christ. And here's what I was talking about. When you find a contradiction within a book, within the pages of itself, even the New King James, the, the verse I quoted to you in Luke 12, 51, Jesus said, and I'll read from the New King James where he says, Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. Basically says the same exact thing as the, as the King James does in that verse. They didn't change that one where Jesus Christ says that he came to bring division. By the, the translation itself, in that New King James Version, Jesus Christ said that he came to bring division. But then within the pages of its own, of its own translation, it's saying to reject a divisive man. That is a contradiction in and of itself within the pages of that book. That is not God's Word. God's Word does not have contradictions. God's Word is not going to say to reject Jesus Christ. But the New King James Version tells you that, and you could get that from reading those, those scriptures. Again, I tried to, I had to, I have to time my sermons appropriately because we only have so much time to go through this stuff. There are plenty more inaccuracies, errors, Problems and again, I don't think that these are these are just um, mistakes out of ignorance. These are attacks on God's word. They're strategically placed. There are specific things that are removed and changed, and there are things that don't even exist in any manuscripts. And I didn't go into that, but the, some of these changes, even some of the ones that we looked at today, are in zero manuscripts. 
the words that they used, yet they still use that words, those words. Why would you do that? It's deceptive. Their whole purpose for, for even putting out that version of the Bible, that perversion of the Bible, was, was to try to make things just a little bit easier to understand. And that's what they all say. And I'll tell you what, everything that we, that we saw today, all of these changes, there's nothing new in that. These all exist in, all, in, in the, new, the, the other modern versions. Everything that we looked at today, you can find in, in multiple of the other modern versions. All of those changes that were made were made in all those other ones. So what did it bring that was different? It just made, it's just trying to make the King James more like all of these other false versions of the Bible. That's what they're doing. That's exactly the plan. And, and it's, what it's doing is saying, okay, well, I know that there's a lot of Christians that are going to reject the NIV. Because when you re completely remove verses like Acts 8, 37, when you just completely remove and chop out all these verses, you know, some Christians aren't going to go for that. That's, that's a little bit too, that's just a little bit too obvious. So we'll come out with this new King James. Because it's not as obvious. Because you can look at a lot of the famous verses. You can look at John 3.16 and it's barely, it's barely touched. Right? Where, where a lot of people, if you don't really, really know from the King James, you can look, you just look right over it. And there's lots of verses like that. I was, uh, I was going through that book the other day and just kind of reading through some chapters. I was reading John 1, John 2, John 3. And there's a lot of stuff that bothered me, but it's hard to even put your finger on it. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, that's just not quite right. And it's not. They're just not quite right. And it's hard to put your finger on it sometimes. It's hard to see where the, the real major problem is, but it's there. And, and a lot of them you can read me like, okay, this says the same thing. Okay, this says the same thing. Okay, this says the same thing. You know, and you go verse by verse. Yeah, it's basically saying the same thing, same thing. But then, boom, it hits you. I mean, y these are not saying the same thing. All these references that we looked at today, they are not the same thing. They are different, and, and they cannot both be true. And I'll tell you what, the, we know what the truth is. We have, it, we have it right here. We've had it for 400 years. And... Um, Anyways, I hope, I hope you learned something today. I mean, the, God's word is pure. He's not going to have contradictions. He's not going to have errors. There is going to be nothing wrong with his word. If it's coming from God, then we know that it's pure, it's true, it's purified, and he's preserving it for us. He's doing the work of preserving it for us. We have it today. It's available, and it's found in the King James. Don't be deceived by these modern versions. They try to be subtle. I mean, the, the, the devil is a snake. He's a serpent. He's the most subtle. He's trying to get in there and he's trying to just, just twist God's word and twist our thinking. Because if you, if you continue to read you know, these false versions, it will affect what you believe in your doctrine. It will. Because you're looking at a book and thinking that it's God's word. I mean, that would do that to anyone. If I'm reading a book and I think I have God's word and I'm reading it and it's incorrect and it's inaccurate and it's wrong, hey, that's going to... That's going to throw you off. It's going to it's going to mess up your doctrine. It's going to even if it just tweaks it a little bit. I mean, you're going to you're going to be off by by not having God's pure words. So um, anyway, and, and the reason why I picked that one is because if you can at least see this one, which is the most is, is the most closely resembles the truth, then it should be easy to say, oh yeah, well all the rest of them are are, are garbage because the one that's even the closest to this one is is way off. These other ones are just, just exponentially worse and worse and worse. Um, so if I could convince you on this, then, then the other ones you don't even need convincing on because you, you could look up all these other references and they'll exist in, in those as well. But the, the other references from like the NIV, they don't always line, you know, the New King James will be right. You know what I mean? So you can't always go back, back the other way. But with the New King James, yeah, you can apply those to, to all the other new versions. But let's, uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for preserving your word for us today. God, we know that you want us to know you, to know about you, to know how to serve you. And, um, and you've revealed your words to us so that we can know you. And, and you've promised to preserve them, dear Lord, and we believe that. I believe that, dear God. I believe that with all of my heart that you have preserved your words for us today and that we have them. And it's found in, in our authorized version of the Bible, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just... Help us not to be deceived by, by all of Satan's subtleties and, and his attacks on your word. And that you would please just continue to bless our church and, and bless us individually, dear Lord. Help us to, to gain more knowledge and more wisdom.